feeling uh, research data in the social sciences and uh, humanities. Um, uh, the presentation uh, has a focus on the research data management. Uh, you uh, already uh, have received the briefing paper. We are responsible uh, for that. And uh, that will be an, uh, an uh, object, uh, subject to this in uh, this afternoon uh, in, the, in the afternoon sessions. I will come to that later. Uh, this is the outline of our presentation. Uh, there should no, I can't walk away, but I can't see it very well. Uh, there should be an uh, introduction of the open research uh, data pilot. But uh, this morning, uh, Karin already told you everything I wanted to say about this uh, in this introduction. So. Uh, well, that's, that's better for you because uh, this presentation is between you and the lunch, so it uh, will uh, save some time. Um, so I will skip another, I will skip about uh, 10 slides or something like that. Um, then uh, my colleague uh, Marjan will tell you more about the research data management. Uh, it's, uh, it's in the... Uh, prepare for responsible uh, research and also um, the roles uh, and responsibilities uh, during the research projects. Then I will come back to you for the data services, well you already heard a little bit about it, uh, like uh, Sonodo and, uh, and the, the data, uh, when you can find your uh, data repository, but I will uh, be more elaborate on that. And, uh, and then we'll, I will give you a short summary, and uh, later I will tell you more about uh, these afternoon sessions. Uh, well, I can uh, skip the next uh, slide, so I will do this. Wait a minute. information we already heard so and also information about uh, uh, research uh, data pilots so if you need information uh, you can find it, uh, you can find it here and now I will skip some slides see, it looks like the other slides <laughs> okay prepare for uh, responsible research my God. I'm going to start with um, a brief video clip. So Ellie didn't say much so far, I'm going to say less.
the, the document is not a fixed document. So data management planning is uh, working on a living document. That is a very pleasant statement, of course. You should deliver it in the first six months as a project deliverable, but you are supposed and welcome to change things, expand information, and so on. The summary here, below the, the orange bar, says, okay, this is a couple of questions and topics within this template. Remember that there are a lot of templates in the tool, so they are different in that respect. And basically what's in the blue field is what you are supposed to provide the information on. And it goes through the whole process of carrying out research. This is what it looks like if you're starting to fill out the plan. Um, this was the place where I entered my fictitious identifier for this fictitious plan. Um, and it's one of the setting of questions and answers. On the right hand side, you see the guidance. In this particular field, this uh, guidance provided by the EC from this famous annex number one, the annex to the description of writing a data management plan. But it could also be uh, guidance provided by the DCC. Another slide I'd like to um, recommend to look at in this application, even if you are still writing your initial EMP, it makes sense to look at what is being asked of you at later stages during the project. And basically, um, the information here is about making your uh, data reusable, so it asks questions about how will the data become discoverable for others, how will others be able to assess the value of the data for their own purposes, and so on. So you don't have to fill out this template within six months, but it is sensible to at least look at it. And there are some initiatives within the open air community to see if these two templates could be integrated to one template, um, and you have to answer only a couple of questions initially, and you flesh, out, flesh it out during the project and then it would be a bit more coherent, but that's ongoing work. This was the easy part. There is a template. The more complicated part, of course, is what to write in it, in a particular case, of your project, with your consortium. And open science is about collaboration, and it's about collaboration between lots of um, organizations of different natures. So this is roughly um, the couple of the team of stakeholders that you will be dealing with when you carry out a project. And the researcher is quite central here, um, and the researcher will probably have what we call a front desk um, or front office, a help desk within the organization, the knowledge institution, or within the discipline, or both, that would be even better. And typically, the front office in the discipline or in the organization will provide information on legal issues. Who is allowed to do what with the data and what should I write in the plan? Or practical IT information, what kind of facilities do we have for safely dealing with the data while we are working? Um, and that's also the, the institution that might have their own data policies or data management policies. It's not just funders which are very active in developing policies in the area. And policies could be very incompatible. That's just a fact of life. Um, that won't be solved within a short time, but it is good if um, front office people within an organization are aware of that and can tell the researchers, yes, that's how it is, don't worry, it's a pilot, we'll live. The research funder is a clear stakeholder. Um, front offices might also want to collaborate with what you call back offices, um, Long-term archives, for instance, could be considered as a back office. Organizations that provide um, secure data transfer or high-performance computer computing could be so-called back office services. They need not be within your discipline, they need not be within your organization. So that's meant here with the front office, back office um, separation of concerns. Publishers have data availability policies, or they don't have, but they might get them, so they will impose some um, restraints and constraints on the researcher to provide them with data. And, of course, uh, within the projects, 
there are many private organizations as well, and they can have their traditions and considerations on what could be done with the data and what could not be done with the data. All these stakeholders should ideally be involved in writing the plan so that the plan is not important. It is the planning, as was said this morning, and it is an instrument for communication. It's not just administration, please. Okay, let's recall the goal. We are still in this early stage of preparing for the real project. We are in this first couple of months. And the idea is that at the end of the project, the data will be well curated and preserved. Now here comes my negative slide. Um, storing data on a hard disk, or a USB stick, or even on your organization's server, is not necessarily curating and preserving, that is just storage. Curating is typically meant to include activities like enriching the data. If data has been reused in a couple of years, uh, it is nice to refer to publications based on that reuse and add that information on the future publications to the data themselves. That is an instance of curation of data. Preserving includes activities like making sure that the data files remain usable over time, so it might include converting data to another format. That is not done when you only store the data somewhere at the hard disk. Now, if you have archived the data properly, that in itself doesn't mean that the data will be found. It is up to the researchers to provide good metadata, good descriptions, good information, good keywords, and so on, in order for the data to be found in a repository. If they are findable, it does not necessarily mean that they are also accessible. Um, it has to be clear who has access to the data, so that it's a legal issue perhaps, or an ethical issue, but it could also be a technical issue that has to be solved. If the data have been archived and they are found and they can be accessed, it doesn't mean that they will be usable if you have not explained what a variable means, or if, what, or if it's not clear what definition you in your research have used for high blood pressure. So the data will not be compatible to data from other sources. That's the word here, interoperability. Even if you have taken care to make them understandable by providing all the information, they might still not be usable if you have worked in obsolete, outdated, unavailable software, for instance. So there's a lot to think about, but the upswing of this is that you should provide the context with the data. That was already illustrated in the talk this morning by Professor Martins. Um, it's also about the code and so on. Let's see what it means. This is a lot of text. Uh, the blue words are the most important. So, we talk about data management, but data is only part of the package. We need a metadata. Traditionally, of course, things like title and who created it, and since when it has been available. Um, ideally, you use a metadata standard that is common in your line of work. And if there is nothing available in your line of work, well, that might be a good idea to start talking about standards. Um, it is a slow process. We learned this morning if you want to do it in an open, inviting way, but it can be done and it is being done. And for the time being, you could, you could rely on existing generic metadata schemes, and a couple of them are mentioned here. Furthermore, you are expected to provide information and documentation, like, depending on your domain, of course, code books, explaining variables, um, lab journals, Preferably electronic lab journals and not paper ones. Um, if you're dealing with uh, respondents or you interview people, for instance, you might have informed consent forms. Now, uh, the sensitive information of a consent form need not necessarily be shared with everyone. The fact that there are consent forms where people have stated, okay, it's okay that you use my data in my interview for this or that type of research, 
that gives us only more information for the next user. And everything you've used in, an, uh, in the range of instruments and tools, uh, queries in the syntax, pro uh, syntax queries in your statistics program, um, the configurations of the machine that you have used, it is all relevant. Now here, sometimes confusion starts, because this is relevant for replicating studies. That's why sometimes a package like this is called a replication package. If a replication package is okay, it includes everything that uh, an intelligent colleague can use to trace back what you have done. Actually, we of course are hoping for more, not just replication or replicability. We are aiming towards the more creative kinds of reuse, used in other, for other questions, used in other areas and so on. So a replication package might be a term that is too limiting, if you have better ideas about the term, I'd like to hear it in the breakout sessions this afternoon. For we are looking for terms that um, sell well. This discussion could also arise about the notion of data, because this is all fine and good, but uh, yeah, in my domain it's somewhat different. There's always someone who says, yes, but in our domain things are different. And they are right, because in your domain, in your domain, in your domain, things will be different. And that is why so, that is why it's so important that initiatives start within disciplines. So there is, of course, top-down um, initiatives from funders, for instance, or from your board of directors. But please take also initiatives from the grassroots and the disciplines. Develop your own standards. Another possible bone of contention um, is oh, that's quite a lot that we should deposit at the end of the project. Yes, that's true. But it doesn't mean that you have to deposit everything that's, that's gone through your hands and through your computers over a couple of years. There are two good reasons for making a cut on what should be deposited and what doesn't have to be deposited. One of them was already raised in the grant agreement. Um, there are good reasons for leaving some information, some data, out of the public domain. That doesn't mean you have to opt out of the whole pilot. You can stay in the pilot, but just writing your data management plan, I'm going to um, make this section of the data available under a restricted access license for so and so reasons. At least that it is explicit. And people know they can ask you for it if they have good reason to think, okay, maybe I can get still access. The other kind of selection is the selection that it may not need to be positive if things are can easily be um, reproduced. Um, we hear examples from physics, for instance, where storing the huge uh, amount of data is very costly. Storing it in a sensible way with all the documentation that we would like to have makes it even more expensive. But the work can be done again and again and again, so you can just repeat the experiment. Of course, this is again domain dependent, but please think about it and motivate in your plan why you select those things and why you make such choices. repositories, databases, storage, and so on. Um, Pedro told a bit about Zenodo. Ellie will go a bit more deeper into uh, archiving and what have you, because it's also our background, so we like to talk about it. Basically, it is a place where you store things safely. Um, and we like to promote the idea of trustworthy digital repositories, not Every repository is trustworthy. That, now, I'm not intending to bash colleagues who manage repositories. That is not what we mean. What we mean is, if a repository does not have the mission and the corresponding budget to invest in keeping things available in the long term, they will probably not uh, apply for a certification 
as being a trustworthy repository. I leave the rest to Annie. Remember, we were still in the process of writing the plan. We were still in those early stages. This slide you've seen, I, this is the recap. If you have collected all the information from your stakeholders, made things explicit, have made some choices, and run the face of them uh, in the plan, you are now ready to export your plan. You can do this in several forms, but probably the European Commission will be happy to receive it as a PDF. Um, and that's basically it. And remember, it's a living document, so this was the preparation stage. This was a large number of slides. During the project, which will take more time, you will still be, you, researcher, your, um, your customers, I might say, perhaps. They will carry out the project, um, and you will be involved again. Perhaps in another role. Because <clears throat> during the research, questions might pop up like, OK, I know I have to anonymize my sensitive data. Um, what is the state of the art to, to do that? Or is there a state of the art trusted party that could do it for me? Another question might be, um, how can I share my data with colleagues outside the consortium? Is that okay? Do we have a tool for that? What, do we need to um, have them sign a contract? Another question could be, okay, um, I'm using a new instrument which is fine, but the data format is different. How should I go about to make the data format as sustainable as possible? My data turn out to be bigger than I thought. Um, now they don't fit a repository. Where can I find another repository? So a lot of questions can pop up during the project. And the stakeholders and you we will be asked to help answer them. And during the project, it makes sense to do what Pedro has already introduced. Think about linking the data and publications. And I'd like to take a data-centric approach and to just claim, not originally, that the publication is part of the context information to the data. I fully agree with the idea that the life of the data will probably be longer than that of the publication. Um, but there is no need for you to include the publication into this package. No, please put it in another good repository and make sure that the repositories talk to each other. Either because the repository can uh, accommodate data and publication at the same time, or because um, you use smart persistent identifiers that help to trace the relations and keep them sustainable. I started with uh, the movie that was brought out to so speak about Horizon 2020. Um, and there are also some incentives, of course, that are broader than this, just the project and the project funding. So a recent um, paper was published in the astrophysics domain. It's one of the areas where people have looked into the question, okay, what's in it for me if I go to take this extra trouble of uh, properly archiving my uh, data and linking to them? Well, the good news is, although it is hardly above uh, anecdotal information so far. The good news is papers that link to data are cited more frequently than papers that do not link to data. If that's not incentive, I don't know what is incentive for a researcher. Another incentive might be, I am so pleased to see my old data get a new life. Uh, in 1977, there was an expedition to Spitsbergen um, where the scientists took a lot of data on biomass and vegetation, and the data were analyzed to um, the map that you see at the left hand side. It is too detailed, of course, on the larger screen. But when last, this summer uh, a new expedition went there, 
they had the map and they found that the underlying uh, details data was still available and usable. So they could make a new map, of course with new techniques and technology, and they were able to compare the changes throughout these four decades. So that's interesting, that is long-term thinking. And of course, the, the funders involved in this second expedition were very pleased to be part of this expedition, and their website is lovely, so please take a look there, even if you're not interested in the data. And the ultimate incentive, of course, if nothing else helps, and no, data management does not prevent theft. Uh, 
And uh, it's also important that that uh, the repository uh, helps uh, with uh, with how to cite uh, the data. Um, well, you see the um, the registry of uh, research data repositories. Uh, it's an uh, a repository can register. Uh, uh, in him herself, how you say it. Uh, they're from uh, uh, all kinds of academic disciplines, it doesn't stick to one. Um, uh, it's for permanent storage, of course, and it's uh, funded by the German uh, Research uh, Foundation. And at this moment, there are around uh, 1368 uh, repositories you can find in it. Uh, you can search in it for, for example, uh, by discipline, but also uh, by country. And here, is, this is very nice. You can see the green ones are the uh, uh, countries uh, where there is a registry of a research data repository. Uh, of course, if it's uh, the blue color, it doesn't mean that, it's, uh, that there aren't uh, digital repositories because it can be possible that it's not registered in this uh, uh, data.org. Well, of course, the no no. Pedro's already showed us some slides. Uh, I think it's very nice that they also have a community, a community so you can. Um, uh, so all the data of one community uh, can come together. Here you see that from the European uh, Commission. Uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, publication and data sets already in it. 13,000 uh, publications and 1,600 uh, data sets with all, uh, other, uh, all kinds of uh, information. Um, of course, uh, Sonodo uh, uh, it has all kinds of features like it that will give you uh, it will give the researcher uh, a permanent uh, identifier for the data set. Uh, you can uh, it's nice that you can search uh, uh, that you share you can share the data you can search for the data uh, and not only data of course also publication etc. You can, what, what I said, you can, all, you can uh, create your own community uh, and it's, and it's safe, uh, safer than uh, information on your, uh, keep it on your computer. Uh, for open air, uh, to make the language open air, uh, there are already uh, 11,000 data sets in open air. And here you can see uh, uh, information about it. Uh, for example, the data providers are named, you can uh, find the data sets uh, by data provider, or by, uh, by year, or by access mode, etc. And this, well, you must know this slide. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I'm glad you didn't show it this morning. <laughs> but uh, this, uh, this is, I think that's very nice that you can uh, see the relation uh, between the publications and the data sets. Uh, 52 publications from diff 20 different uh, open air data providers. And there are uh, 392 data sets from Malaya. It's in, uh, a repository in the, a data repository in the earth and environmental uh, sciences. Uh, and the project is uh, Hypox, an FP7 project. Uh, it's about uh, ecosystems, and you can find uh, the description of the project, but you can also find uh, data sets and publications. And here, one from uh, Gens, and uh, the data set from the data repository. I think this, this is a very nice idea. It's not, you don't do it for the European Commission, you do it for uh, sharing information with uh, other researchers. So, a very short summary. Uh, we talked, well, Caroline talked about the research uh, project in nine uh, 
the last in 2020 areas are uh, automatically uh, part of the pilot. Uh, we had a we had about opt in, uh, opt in and opt in out possibilities. Uh, Marianne talked about uh, data management uh, plan. Um, of course, uh, if, if the data uh, has been uh, this possibly deposit in a repository. Uh, you have to make it open, for example, Creative Commons, uh, CC O of uh, CC uh, BY uh, license. And there are now 11,000 uh, data sets in open air. This is the slogan of the European Commission, as open as possible, as close as uh, needed. And this is a cartoon from the RDA uh, plenary uh, last year in uh, Amsterdam. I think it's also very, it's well, it's started since a few years now, uh, that it's very important to also uh, uh, take care of, uh, of the data and even uh, make them open and available. So that was the presentation about uh, the open research data pilot. Just a uh, one minute for the, for the afternoon uh, session. Um, uh, DAS is uh, responsible for the task research data management and training support uh, and we did with a digital support kit uh, for this and uh, we've made a briefing paper about research data management and we all received, it, received it and it will be uh, the focus of this uh, afternoon. Uh, our program is that we have uh, uh, then we will talk about uh, what kind of challenges you think they are uh, in your country for your research data management. Uh, we want a little bit of breakout sessions uh, about the uh, about the brief uh, we've made, and then a wrap up and uh, see if there are more questions. I'll see you all this afternoon. Thank you, Ellie. Um, any questions at this point, you can talk about in the breakout groups, of course, this afternoon for more details. But if there's a, a question you would like to ask right now, which is relevant for the whole group. for the whole group. <laughs> um, it's a call for action. There is a petition um, launched by LERU, the League of European Research Universities, called Christmas is Over, and it deals with the horrible practice of double tipping by visitors. Um, and it calls for action. Uh, LERU wants to put this on the agenda on the European Commission under the Dutch Presidency. And I really urge you, all of you, to sign this because they would like to have at least 10,000 uh, signatures. It's now, I think, 7,000 something. And it should not just be the little university signing this. It's a matter that all of us are confronted with. The libraries um, you need to cut budgets, whether they want it or not. And the researchers should not be paying money for publications. Research money should go to research. So please look up the tag, Christmas is over, and sign the petition. Yeah, okay. Uh, that's absolutely important. <laughs> um, is there anything? And so let's uh, keep questions, discussions for this afternoon. And then let me give a word uh, about the session this afternoon. No, I have a separate one. I did it. Because this afternoon we want you to work. Not only you can have people. Um, oh yeah, I'll already see what I have to do. Now, this afternoon, um, you all have a dot, a colored dot on your name label. Um, and we divided the groups because we wanted really a mix of people in the groups. That's why we mixed you all up uh, up front. 
um, we, we want, want to have uh, people, people who know already some things about open air services and, and the mandate and people not knowing much about it, uh, mixing up with people that are more involved in project coordination and others uh, know as National Open Access Desk, because we want really interaction this afternoon. We want to hear from you how um, we can help you even further, which support is needed, uh, how can we improve the services that we offer. So, so this, this is, is what will happen this afternoon. Um, so there are four groups, uh, before coffee and after coffee, each time we have two groups uh, talking about uh, the same topic, and after coffee break you switch to the other topic. So uh, the green ones, for example, will uh, talk first uh, in the library, which is down here, uh, just beneath us, uh, about the data pilot, uh, while in the afternoon they will talk about uh, the mandate on open access uh, in practice in the press conference, but that's uh, my group, so you just I will just gather you and take you with me because it's in another part of the building. Um, the Blancard room is up here. So we have the library here under my feet, uh, which is first for the green group and then for the red group. Uh, the Blancard cell is just one more up, uh, and Blancard uh, will first be occupied by the yellow group and afterwards by the blue group. And then you have Vermeulen here, this is Vermeulen, and uh, press conference room, um, that's following me. So uh, the first group for me, the red, people with red dots, follow me just after lunch to that room, and then after coffee break, um, there will be a coffee break in between, of course. Uh, the, the people, people from the green group can follow me in the next conference. <coughs> then we get back here uh, because we will report about what's happening in these groups. What are the questions uh, that come up and uh, round up and afterwards we have a reception at 5 o'clock. So I hope you can stay for that too. Uh, now off to lunch, which is at the same uh, room uh, we had before, and at 2 sharp we will start, so please, just before 2 o'clock, uh, go to the room uh, where you have to be. Also at the registration desk, there is, it's indicated, so, uh, and you can always ask us. Okay, thank you. Enjoy your lunch.